Okay, so I'm going to talk today uh, about what I call pharmacotypes within the schizophrenias. Um, there are two words I'll point out at the beginning. First, pharmacotypes, which is a word that I believe I've made up myself um, to describe subtypes of illness based that can be defined on the basis of drug response. Um, and then the other thing to point out is that I talk about the schizophrenias, which is actually how um, the schizophrenias were originally described. Um, the point I'll make now and for anybody who talks to me at any point in time is that what we call schizophrenia is probably not just one illness with one pathophysiology uh, rather um, the data all kinds of data including the pharmacological data that i'll show that i'll discuss today um, pretty much pound the table in making you think that uh, we're looking at a number of different diseases that have broadly sim broadly similar symptoms um, and that's a point of great confusion uh, both in medicine and research as well as in uh, patient care. But I think, under, I think thinking about schizophrenia as a, as a plural disease um, is, is, a helpful, is a helpful framework. Um, I'll lead with what I lead in many of my public lectures. Um, I point out that I have a PhD in pharmacology and that means I love drugs, exclamation point. I, I truly do love drugs. Um, I found them, you know, insanely interesting since when I, for as long as I can remember. Um, I love drugs for two reasons. One, because as a human being with you know, um, some compassion in his heart. I love that I can use chemicals to alleviate suffering and in some cases um, just eradicate diseases. Uh, so I love the ability of having a tool uh, that can be very effective in practicing medicine. Um, so, uh, you know, as, as a physician, I love drugs for that. Um, but as a pharmacologist, I love drugs because drugs tell the truth. Um, and, and especially in a field like psychiatry where all of our diagnoses rely upon fuzzy concepts like mood or behavior or internal experiences, psychic experiences. Um, these are very um, hard to measure. Uh, they're certainly measurable, but um, more, with more difficulty and with more error around the measurement. Um, so in a field like psychiatry, drugs and the responses are touchstones to physiological reality. They interact with systems and they report back to us. Um, and so if, if a symptom improves in response to a drug, then I have a very good idea that what the drug does in the body is somehow related to the expression of symptoms. And if I give a drug to somebody and their symptoms don't get much better, uh, one explanation that I should consider that everybody who prescribes should consider is that the things that the drug interacts with in the body are not that relevant to the symptoms which caused the clinician to um, administer the drug in the first place. So thinking in this way, um, I think opens up, it broadens thinking, and I think it can help us um, understand understand illness and 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 better help our patients. So to sort of reframe what I said, uh, drugs have two identities. Uh, one is that they like our little agents of change that we use them to, to, uh, to treat illness. Um, that's how we're typically taught in medicine. Uh, but they're also interrogators of physiology. Um, so every single treatment that you do, whether it's using a drug or even a psychotherapy, um, ultimately is testing a pathophysiological hypothesis. And when the response is not as you predict, then uh, you should you should think rethink your hypothesis. So let me introduce to you, um, or let me like hammer home that way of thinking, and also introduce you to the concept of pharmacotype um, by by just imagine a world in which we don't know about pneumonia. Um, we don't have that as official diagnosis, and imagine that we approach pneumonia um, the way that the American Psychiatric Association would approach anything else. Um, we know that there's a syndrome whereby people have uh, high temperatures and coughs, so we come up with a name, uh, to, we'll call it cough dyspnea and high body temperature, CDHD, I call it here. Um, and we, we elaborate some criteria so that we'll have great reliability in who gets assigned this diagnosis of CDHD. Um, and then, serendipitously, we find this stuff called penicillin. Uh, we call it a pyrotussid agent, um, and uh, we call it, the, the because it's the first one to discover, we'll call it a typical uh, pyrotussid. 
And uh, it gets better, I mean, it makes a lot of people better. So we would conclude that our disease, um, CDHD, is caused by what the drug penicillin works on, which is to kill gram-positive bacteria. Hooray, we've had a victory for science. Um, but then it turns out that maybe about 30% of people with CDHD um, are not getting better with penicillin. Uh, we can look to our pharmaceutical friends and they can come up with some derivatives and we can look at, say, you know, the cephalosporins and we'll call them second generation or atypical antipyrotus evasions using the way that we think about in psychiatric terms. Um, and we find that they, you know, that, that the second generation drugs um, don't have, they have a different side effect profile and they do capture some of the cases that didn't get better with the first generation penicillins and so another victory. But we still had that problem of, you know, 10 or 15 percent of people with what we call now pneumonia not getting better with penicillin or cephalosporins. Um, so then, taking from the current playbook in psychiatry, we can look to give long-acting injectable drugs uh, when we suspect that non-response, uh, non-therapeutic non responses due to non-adherence. Um, and we can do things like combine them or give them high doses or give some injectable and oral, you know, and all sorts of the things. But the problem is uh, the same, that we're, um, we're actually not um, treating the, the, the real problem, which is that not all uh, pneumonias are caused by gram-positive bacteria. Um, so, to, to summarize, in, we, in this example, we can say that we can, we can look at pharmacotypes, you know, response or non-response to penicillin or to azithromycin or to isoniazide, and uh, following that, we can ultimately deduce ultimate causes of this uh, clinical syndrome, and in these hypothetical pharmacotypes, we can, we can see that pneumonia can be, or that cough and fever uh, can be parsed into gram-positive infections, gram-negative infections, and, and uh, tuberculous infections. Um, so that's, I don't think, controversial, except for the part where I've um, made a little fun of the way that our profession goes about doing things. Uh, pharmacotypes are actually par for the course in every field of medicine, in many fields of medicine, and um, I'm going to now talk about hypertension, um, citing here, this is a fabulous, hypertension, high blood pressure is fabulously relevant as an example of psychiatric illnesses. Um, very easy to diagnose on a top level, seemingly easy to understand, but uh, medication responses are highly variable, and that's because underlying hypertension with this top-level symptom easy to recognize are many different pathophysiologies. Um, and I assert that you know, our variable responses of medications, especially in diseases like depression or anxiety, um, you know, speak to the fact that there's a whole bunch of different um, parts under the hood. So in the terms of uh, just looking at to, com to complete the pharmacological discussion. Um, Antihypertensive drugs, we can target volume of the, the intravascular volume, we can target the, the, the tone of the arteries, and we can change that either by directly changing the internal second messengers or the calcium flux or some other things like uh, angiotensin signaling. And we can also fiddle with the, the heart contraction and we can, we can approach um, pressure from a variety of targets. And you know, any clinician that treats hypertension will see that a lot of people get better with a diuretic, but some of them don't. And uh, some people get really better with calcium channel blockers and not so much with other things. So, so that, that tells us that, I mean, the drugs in these examples are speaking to um, the different pathways of high blood pressure. Uh, we're, you know, we haven't embraced pharmacotypes in psychiatry because number one, um, it will cause an alarming change in thinking that we should be categorizing illness according to drug response, and there's a lot of resistance in the field to doing that uh, sort of retroactive diagnosis. Um, and the other thing is that we are kind of stuck, as opposed to hypertension drugs, where there's a half dozen mechanisms to choose from. In the treatment of depression, there are maybe two neurotransmitters, possibly three that we can fiddle with. In the case of schizophrenia, there's not a whole lot other than the, the, the antipsychotic drugs. So it's, so it's a little unnerving um, to contemplate the, the meaning of non-response, but we should. Um, I'm gonna skip this part. Basically, the idea that schizophrenia is multiple illnesses is not a new idea. It was actually um, origin in, in the original coiner of schizophrenia term, uh, Eugene Bloiler, he said, we should think of this as a group of different diseases. Um, and, to just reiterate the point that schizophrenia is not one illness, 
uh, how we define it these days is actually a, um, a philosophical mongrel or a, or a mutt. We have uh, we, we take the Kreplinian idea of um, of a de degenerative process and we fuse that with a Freud-inspired a Bleuler um, view about um, psychodynamics and the, the, the disturbance of mental associations being a key feature. And we, you know, we put them together and that's how we define operationally. We can diagnose it reliably, but it doesn't mean it's caused by the same thing. Um, related to pharmacotypes, um, I will say that trajectories of illness have been telling us from the beginning that not all schizophrenia are the same. Uh, Kreplin himself said that schizophrenia, or what he called dementia precox, was the illness from which no one recovers. But then Kreplin, using his own criteria, found that um, uh, more than 10% of his patients actually recovered quite well. So he simply kicked them out. He said that they, he'd been incorrect in his original diagnosis of them. Um, also, in the pre-neuroleptic era, uh, the son of Eugen Bloiler, Manfred Bloiler, did a study, and he found that, that, that almost a quarter of people with schizophrenia made a full recovery, and another 40% had very significant improvement to the point that they could have meaningful work and meaningful relationships outside the hospital. Um, in modern era, uh, we find that about 20% of individuals can ultimately become medicine-free. <laughs> Um, and do quite well. Um, another 30% or so will require extraordinarily low doses of medications and about half will require standard dosing. So there you have a little signature of mother nature that will be called schizophrenia um, is perhaps many different diseases, uh, or at least in that case, three different diseases. Um, so, I regret putting these slides in, but um, I regret this because I wanted to make this a little bit shorter, but I'll go through quickly these slides. Um, to again hammer the home the idea that not all schizophrenia is the same. If we were to discover this today, we would approach it entirely diff differently than you know we historically have in the field. We would apply big data to it and genetics. And if we did big data and genetics, um, we would conclude perhaps as these, these individuals have, that looking at genetic clusters you would have 17 different clusters of gene and biochemical distortions. So within schizophrenia, um, using large data, you can recognize 17 different genetic clusters. Um, and also in these studies where they did very, very, very fine-grained symptom uh, measurement um, and looking for natural associations amongst those symptoms, then there would be eight different clinical syndromes within you know, the DSM-labeled schizophrenia. Um, if we do uh, poor man's imaging, which is to say EEG, uh, we would find that there are six different um, electroencephalographic signatures. Uh, the figure here are um, brain electrical activity maps. So they show the power in, in the column, they're in delta, theta, alpha, and beta. So these are frequency bands. Um, and the color shows higher voltage or lower voltage within those bands, uh, band wavelengths. And the point is that there are um, six discernible um, patterns of EEG distortions amongst people with schizophrenia. And actually, you see the same process, the same breakout of EEG patterns in people that have non-schizophrenic psychoses as well. Um, but uh, this is about pharmacotypes, and I am uh, started off my life as a pharmacologist. So if we were to discover schizophrenia today, um, people in my tribe would, approve, would, approve, would, would use the classical pharmacology approach, which is to let nature tell us what she has under the hood by simply looking at how systems respond to drug perturbation. Um, and doing in pharmacotyping, uh, there are clearly four types of schizophrenia. Um, type 1 is a rapid and robust response, and rapid is usually measured in the, in the time frame of days to weeks. Um, and uh, as I'll show you in a second, that subtype very easily map, uh, maps to biomarkers of high dopamine signaling. Uh, type 2 is slow yet robust, so people can have a very good recovery, but the time frame of recovery unfolds um, over months rather than weeks. Uh, type 3 is no significant response to traditional dopamine blockers, aka non-clozapine antipsychotic drugs, but having a good response to clozapine. So in type 3 and 4, that represents about 30% of the population. 
um, and about half of those will be in type three, having a good response to clozapine. And type four is not responding uh, well to traditional drugs and not responding well to clozapine. Um, arguably type five is in there, but I don't know precisely how it fits, and that is a lithium responsive schizophrenia, uh, which was an entity which was researched in the 70s and 80s and kind of just vanished from, from attention. But clearly four types based upon these, well, uh, widely accepted metrics. Um, and these pharmacotypes, uh, why it's important to study them is because um, they actually, they track to biochemical changes or to biomarker changes. So as I said, type one rapid responders, uh, they have dopamine disease. Um, I, think it's, I think it's fair to say that type one pharmacotype should be renamed dopamine psychosis and the other pharmacotypes called non-dopamine or normal dopamine psychosis. Um, type 2, the slow responders actually have normal dopamine, but they have uh, marked biomarkers of inflammation. And uh, type 3, in the study by Garber, they didn't break out clozapine and non-clozapine groups. Um, type 3 had no evidence of inflammation by those biomarkers and no evidence of a dopamine abnormality. Um, there is a, a, a bit bigger literature and argument. Um, I didn't come up with these names, type A and type B, so you know others are thinking the same thing. But uh, basically, we can now look at some evidence to say, at least as a first cut, we can we can parse the schizophrenia into dopamine psychosis and normal dopamine psychosis. Um, and these are the data. Uh, there's a bimodal distribution of HVA, x-axis is homovanillic acid. That is a um, metabolite of dopamine. Um, under, in, under very precise measurement conditions, plasma HVA, and more so CSF HVA, um, correlate with dopamine turnover. And here you see that in the band with higher HVA, these are the treatment responders, um, so bimodal distribution of metabolites. Uh, if one looks at synaptic density, the density of dopamine synapses in the caudate nucleus, um, we find again uh, two populations. Green bar is normal dopamine synaptic density. Um, the big elevated blue bar, blue bar are the treatment responders. They're the ones that have more dopamine synaptic terminals. Um, and the treatment the so-called treatment resistant group um, actually have uh, lower levels of presynaptic dopamine terminal markers. So two populations based upon dopamine synapses. Um, looking at postsynaptic receptors, uh, again, in the top panel, you see the density of D2 receptors um, from caudate nucleus. And in the bottom panel, you see the same techniques uh, for measuring D2 receptors, but you see clearly two populations, high density and low density. So two populations of schizophrenia based upon dopamine receptor. And uh, in these modern times, we can use uh, positron emitting tags on dopamine precursors. Um, like DOPA, and by doing that, uh, you'll see the green bar is, we, we, by doing that, you can measure in vivo in a human being um, their dopamine synthetic capacity. So the green bar represents the dopamine synthetic capacity of a healthy control group. Uh, dark blue bar shows that in the treatment responders, they have dopamine psychosis. They have higher turnover or higher, higher dopamine manufacturing on PET scan. And interestingly, in the treatment resistant group, there the mean uh, dopamine synthesis is exactly equal to the control group, so normal dopamine. Um, so uh, these findings are not, they, they explain very well what we see in the clinic. Um, and the bottom line is if you have a dopamine disease, dopamine blockers are great for you. And if you have normal dopamine, dopamine blockers don't work, and thus you get called treatment resistant. Um, so to summarize, Lots of evidence that schizophrenia is not a single disease. Um, the variable patterns of medication suggest at least four different diseases under the hood. Um, the low-hanging fruit is to parse psychosis into high dopamine and normal dopamine states. And um, people that don't have dopamine disease don't get better with dopamine drugs. Um, clozapine appears, therefore, to be, I mean, clozapine, we know, is a very low affinity D2 blocker. Um, it probably is probably working by things that um, we don't understand, but uh, it, 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 I'll talk in future lectures about biomarkers of clozapine response and stealing, uh, spoiler alert, it has to do with glutamate signaling in the cingulate gyrus. Um, so this should be altogether a high priority for research and hopefully will help clinicians to um, interpret the meaning of medication non-response and when they encounter it in their practices.